Hi, everybody. My name is James Bullock. I'm the Dean of the School of Physical Sciences, and I'd like to welcome you all here for our virtual talk series today. Um, our speaker today is Professor Steph Salem. Um, she um, will be talking about her research, which has to do with imaging um, the formation of planets around distant stars. Um, before I do the formal introduction, I want to remind everybody that there's a Q&A box at the bottom, and we'll be taking questions throughout the talk, um, and we'll reserve some extra time at the end. And so if you have a particularly pertinent question, please go ahead and ask it. And occasionally, I will try to uh, gracefully uh, ask Steph to, um, uh, to, uh, to answer those questions in real time. It's always a little bit clunky when we're doing it via Zoom, but we'll, we'll do our best today. Um, let me just add that um, if, it, if, if you like what we're doing here and you want to support these kind of activities, um, I encourage you to utilize our text to give button. Um, if you if you text the number four one four four four, and uh, type in the letters P S B L S, um, any donation you give will help support these kind of talks. And in particular, um, if, if you'd like to support the research you see that Steph talks about today, you know you can use that uh, vehicle to do so. Um, if you'd like to hear more about that and getting involved, support astrophysics research and planet uh, exoplanet research here at UCI, you can certainly contact me or anyone on the school uh, leadership team directly. So thanks for that. Um, I, oh, we already have a question, which is, uh, will this session be recorded? And if so, uh, I can share it with others. Uh, definitely, we will be recording this and um, you'll be getting um, an email to this distribution list uh, the same one, you know, the same advertisement, the same way you found out about this, we'll, we'll advertise it there and we'll post it on the school website, et cetera, probably within about 48 hours. Okay, so again, welcome today. You know, the School of Physical Sciences here at UCI has a pretty long history of interest in fundamental important questions about the universe. Um, starting with our founding Dean, Fred Reines, who many of you know, uh, received the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the neutrino. Um, We've been doing fundamental research since uh, the very beginning. In particular, in astrophysics, uh, you know, UC Irvine is in a privileged spot because we have access to some of the most powerful telescopes in the world, uh, privileged access, in fact, to the Keck telescopes in Hawaii. Um, and we're involved in sort of next generation, very large telescopes. And you'll hear a little bit more about that today. Um, so Steph uh, Salem, our speaker today, uh, she's currently an assistant professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. She studies planet formation and in particular is interested in, uh, the, in doing something which is incredible, which is actually taking pictures of the formation of planets orbiting distant stars. So you'll hear more about that amazing technology today. Um, she helps develop new instruments for existing telescopes like Keck, but also for the next generation of extremely large telescopes. Uh, which is going to be even bigger and more powerful and very exciting, especially in the when we talk about questions of exoplanets. Uh, she received a BS in physics and also an Earth, atmospheric, and planetary science from MIT. Uh, she got her PhD in astronomy and astrophysics from the University of Arizona, which is another powerhouse astronomy uh, uh, campus. And before joining UCI as a faculty member very recently, actually, she was an NSF postdoctoral fellow um, and a UC Chancellor's Fellow at UC Santa Cruz. So we're extremely lucky to have her speaking today. We're also super excited to have Steph actually at UCI. She's one of our um, newest faculty members and I think represents the very bright future we have here in astrophysics. So with that, I'll let Steph take it away. Thanks, James, for such a nice introduction. And thanks everyone for, for tuning in. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can everyone see this? Yes, all right, great. So I'm really excited to tell you all today about what I spend most of my time thinking about, uh, which is using high resolution imaging to learn something about how planets form and evolve. 
So you might ask why study planet formation and why should I care about planet formation? And when I motivate this, I always like to start with a picture of the Earth. So we all know that the Earth is a planet. Uh, it might seem silly <laughs> to start here, um, but when you stop and think about it, uh, we are all actually very deeply connected <clears throat> to the processes that go on during planet formation. So the way that planets form determines things like the surface and atmospheric properties of fully grown planets. And properties like that in turn affect the planet's ability to host life, life like us. Uh, so if we can understand how planets form in a general sense, uh, then we can have a better understanding of things like how life develops uh, on our own Earth and on planets in general, uh, and on sort of, uh, of sort of our place in the universe. Um, so how unique is a planet like our Earth um, compared to the thousands of other planets we now know of? So we should all care about planet formation. So I mentioned that we now know of thousands of planets. <clears throat> These are, uh, for the vast majority, exoplanets. So these are planets that orbit stars other than our own sun. And this artist's impression uh, is just intended to uh, give you an idea of how ubiqu ubiquitous planets are. So it is more normal to have uh, a planet around a star than to have a star with no planets. And uh, the, the field of exoplanets has really exploded in the last um, 20 years. So this graphic um, shows you the number of the total number of known exoplanets on the y-axis uh, versus discovery year on the x-axis. And so you can see uh, starting uh, with the earliest discoveries in the 90s, um, which you may know of thanks to the 2019 Nobel Prize in Physics, uh, increasing through the 2000s and really spiking in the last 10 years um, thanks to missions like Kepler and TESS, we now know of more than 4,000 planets around stars other than our own sun. And there's a huge diversity in these planetary systems. Uh, and I, I really like this uh, artist sort of graphic uh, representing in one way, the diversity of something like 500 planets that we knew of as of 2015. So the space here is density, uh, bulk density. So average density of your planet on the x-axis and then temperature on the y-axis. And planets can have bulk densities uh, anywhere between that of water, um, granite, steel, and gold. So there's this huge range of observed planet bulk densities and also a huge range of temperatures. You'll see here uh, temperatures similar to the flame on a Bunsen burner, uh, to boiling water, uh, as cold as Antarctica in the winter, um, and even much colder than that. And so uh, understanding how planets form generally uh, will help us identify the things that give rise to this totally wild diversity of uh, planets that we now know of. Uh, and if you uh, watch uh, Astro News, you might have heard of even less dense planets than the ones that are um, pictured on this graphic, more similar to uh, the density of cotton candy that you would buy in the store. So these are all uh, uh, really exciting uh, discoveries and big questions that we would like to uh, get a better understanding of by studying planet formation. So just to set the stage um, for the research, I figured I would talk a little bit about planet formation in general um, to give everyone some context. So planets form uh, during the star formation process and stars form in giant molecular clouds. So these are clouds of dust and gas that occupy the space between the stars. Uh, and if you're an avid stargazer, you may recognize this particular uh, giant molecular cloud. So this is the Orion cloud complex. You can see the constellation of Orion probably a little bit better now that I've drawn some lines. Uh, and when you form your stars, you start by collapsing a small piece of your molecular cloud. 
And once the cloud has collapsed enough, you'll ignite a young star, which we call protostars. Uh, and the material that continues to fall in uh, has some net angular momentum. And that means that it falls down onto a rotationally supported disk. So these are called protoplanetary disks. Uh, they are the places where we form our planets and they're made up of dust and gas. And they were first discovered uh, in the early 90s by the Hubble Space Telescope, actually in uh, the Orion Nebula. So Hubble uh, looked at the Orion cloud complex and saw against this bright background here, um, these sort of dark smudges that were obscuring the background light. If you take a closer look at one of these, uh, you can see this disk shape. So this dark zone here is dust and gas that's obscuring the bright background nebula. And then this red point here is light from our protostar. So this, these are the earliest pictures of protoplanetary disks. Uh, and in terms of what you should be picturing when you think about these things, uh, protoplanetary disks have sizes of something like a couple hundred astronomical units, uh, where one astronomical unit is the distance between uh, the sun and our Earth. So this cartoon uh, shows you kind of the size scale of protoplanetary disks um, with our solar system as a reference. So here's our Earth. Uh, and it also shows you that these disks are complex. They have lots of structure. Uh, this cutaway shows you uh, generally what the vertical structure of a protoplanetary disk looks like. Uh, you have dust that uh, settles into different layers, depending on how large the grain sizes are. So you would have these sort of cold mid-plane layers with large dust grains, uh, also smaller dust in the, the outer layers of your disk. Um, and there's gas uh, throughout the disk. So this, this is sort of one way of thinking about um, what a protoplanetary disk looks like. And uh, since their discovery, We've studied them in, in great detail, and we now know that uh, protoplanetary disks have really amazing uh, radial structure too. So they have things like uh, gaps and rings. Um, so what you're looking at here is a gallery of uh, millimeter images of protoplanetary disks. So on this last slide, uh, I showed you that there were these large grains toward the center of your, or the midplane of your disk. Um, that's what we're looking at in these images. So you can see that these millimeter sized grains um, have really uh, sort of astounding structure with um, gaps and spirals, uh, tight rings and larger ones. Uh, and all of these features could be connected to planet formation in some way. Um, either through physical processes that go on with the dust grains in the disk uh, or through uh, planets actively interacting with the disk and carving out um, clearings like this. So as far as the details of how planets form, uh, a picture that you can keep in mind is that you're trying to start with your very small dust grains in your protoplanetary disk that have sizes of something like a micron. And you need to be able to get to planet sizes. Um, so one way of doing this is by having larger and larger collisions uh, between growing bodies in your disks. You can go from your micron sized dust to millimeter, centimeter sized grains, um, meter sized boulders up to a kilometer sized uh, bodies that we'll call planetesimals, um, which then go on to become planetary cores and accrete uh, or accumulate gas from your disk um, to build an atmosphere. Uh, and you can end up with a terrestrial planet that has a size of something like a thousand kilometers um, order of magnitude radius, uh, or giant planets that are ten, a few tens times larger. So you can see here, a, yeah. Quick question uh, we have from, from Ruth Ann Evans, um, and you may be getting to this later, but how much time are we talking about 
from start to finish as, as you go through these stages? Yeah, this is perfect timing. Um, I was just about to, to uh, say something about that. Um, so the process of, of forming your star and your planets, uh, we understand takes on order of something like a few million years. Um, and the initial collapse stages where you're forming your stars happens much faster than that, like tens of thousands of years to 100,000 years. Um, and then you'll end up with a protoplanetary disk um, that will have a lifetime of something like a few million years. Uh, and that sounds like a really long time, and it totally is a, a super long time compared to um, you know, human life and our individual lifetimes, but it's actually very short um, compared to the age of the universe, which is something, uh, you know, almost 14 billion years old. Uh, and it's also short compared to the age of our own solar system, uh, which is about uh, a little more than four and a half billion years old. So that means that um, if we just look at any random star and we wonder if it's going to host a protoplanetary disk, uh, the odds are that it won't because these things are pretty short lived. So, um, right, so I talked about how long it takes to get from here to here. Uh, and, and that's a, a pretty short amount of time as far as astronomical time scales go. And it also involves a huge change in size scale. So you notice here that I started with micron sized dust and I'm building things that have uh, sizes of thousands or tens of thousands of kilometers. So this is like 12 to 13 orders of magnitude of growth which is pretty amazing. And so just one last um, picture to kind of put the, the nitty gritty details into context is that this is the, the, kind of, um, the, the kind of cartoon you can imagine for where these things happen. So all of these collisions, um, here's another um, more simple way of showing them, are happening in your protoplanetary disk. And as you build your planets, um, your disk is going to dissipate either because you're locking dust and gas up in these larger bodies uh, or because, well, and because you'll blow some of your material out thanks to things like stellar winds. So your disk is going from something like this, which is very full and dense, to something uh, a little bit more depleted that has young planets in it that are still kind of sweeping up material. So this is the the point in time that I'm going to spend uh, pretty much all of the rest of the talk um, focusing on. So thanks to uh, exoplanet discoveries and to our studies of protoplanetary disks, we know a bunch of stuff already about planet formation. Um, and I wanted to share just two examples of the kinds of constraints we can place on this process using those observations. So one thing we can do, and I, I already kind of alluded to this earlier, is we can look at the fraction of stars hosting protoplanetary disks uh, as a function of how old those stars are. So that's what you're seeing here on the y-axis is how many of my disks or how many of my stars have disks. And on the x-axis, how old are my stars? And the trend that we see is something like this. Uh, where by the time our stars are about 10 million years old, uh, we're very unlikely to see a disk around a star. So protoplanetary disks are depleted by the time your star is around 10 million years old, which means that we definitely need to form our planets faster than in 10 million years. Uh, and more recent evidence suggests that we might need to be even quicker than that, something like a million to a couple million years. So that's one general constraint. Uh, another one uh, is that we can look at the number of stars that host giant planets uh, versus metal abundance. So here, when I talk about metals, I'm using the astronomer's definition, uh, which is any element that is heavier than hydrogen and helium. So basically, you know, how many solids do we have uh, in our protoplanetary disk uh, when we're forming our planets? We can see that the planet occurrence increases if we have more metals available. So that means that uh, the process that's important 
is all of the collisions that lead to our planet core, which are more easy to make happen if you have more metals in your protoplanetary disk. So metal rich stars and their disks are more likely to host giant planets. Uh, so that means that this bottom up growth that I've already described is important where you're going from small dust to rocky um, planetesimal and then to planet cores and then building up your atmosphere. So those are some things we know. Uh, and they're just a couple of examples. There's a lot more that we've learned from exoplanets and disks about planet formation. Uh, but there are a lot of unknowns that we would be able to address better if we had images of planets forming in protoplanetary disks um, and actively interacting with them. So a few examples of some, some things we don't know about planet formation that would benefit from these observations um, is how fast does material fall onto a forming planet? So imagine uh, that we have a couple of forming planets in a protoplanetary disk. They're interacting with their disk. Uh, how quickly are they sweeping material up from their disk? Um, is it relatively steady and at a low level um, or is it super quickly? And we can address this question by looking at how bright the forming planets are. So if your planet was not accumulating very quickly, it wouldn't be too bright. Um, and if it were sweeping up material really fast, uh, it would emit a lot of radiation. Um, and all of this is in the infrared, or most of it is in the infrared. And I will talk about that a little bit later. So that's one question. Uh, another question is what path does the infalling material take? Uh, so we don't know if planets accumulate material through something like a spherical cloud of dust and gas, um, or if the material moves through a disk onto the planet, just like material moves through a disk onto a young star. Uh, we also don't know if, uh, if, we, if the disk scenario is the case, we don't know if the material would go straight in and just fall onto the planet through a boundary between the planet and the disk, uh, or if it would kind of loop in along uh, the young planet's magnetic field lines. These are totally open questions. And one last example is um, how steadily do planets accumulate mass? So I showed you these cartoons before um, where you could have low levels of accumulation um, with some fixed uh, brightness, uh, or you can imagine that you might have really episodic uh, formation where you're accreting, uh, you're accumulating material at a low level for a while and then bursts of uh, your planet really sweeping up a whole bunch of gas and dust. Uh, these are questions that we can answer if we'd be able to monitor um, actively forming planets. So that's the why we would want to do this. And now uh, we can move on to the how. So how do we actually image planet formation? So one first question is where should we look? Uh, and I've shown you these, these pictures already. Uh, we can ask whether these really interesting gaps and rings in protoplanetary disks could be caused by embedded planets? Uh, and the answer is yes. So we've run uh, simulations. Um, lots of people have spent time simulating uh, planets in protoplanetary disks. Uh, and you can see that if you embed a planet, a giant planet in a protoplanetary disk, you can open a gap uh, and also end up with spiral um, spiral structure where your, your planet is pulling gas and dust into the gap. So this is a, a good starting point for where to search for these things is in these gapped protoplanetary disks. So that's the where. And uh, another, another important thing to think about is what wavelengths we should use. And in order to make an informed choice about your wavelength, you need to ask what you think your forming planet might look like. So how bright is your forming planet as a function of wavelength? And so I'll show you um, what we think these things look like. So just to put some uh, anchor points on the x-axis here, this is one micron. So that's the wavelength of the light that we're looking at. 
here's 10 microns. So if you're familiar uh, with the electromagnetic spectrum, you might already notice that we're focusing mostly on the infrared. So uh, visible light is going to be over here uh, with red light being at something like 0 0.6, 0 0.7 microns. And then we're solidly in the infrared for most of this graph. So uh, as material falls onto your planet, gravitational potential energy of the infalling material is converted into radiation. And we expect that the planet brightness as a function of wavelength is going to look something like this. Uh, with this rise um, coming out of the visible and into the infrared, uh, which means that looking at something like a couple of microns, um, which people generally call the near infrared, um, to something like five microns is, is a good place to start. Uh, in addition to this kind of model, uh, we know that gas is falling onto our planet, and we know that most of that gas is hydrogen gas. So we might also expect to see emission at very specific wavelengths that corresponds to transitions in the hydrogen atom. And so what you can imagine here is that you have gas falling into the gravitational potential of your planet. Uh, and as it falls in, it gets really hot. It can get heated up to something like 10,000 degrees. And when that happens, your hydrogens uh, can lose electrons, which will eventually recombine. And as they recombine, they will fall down through these energy levels. And every time there's a transition between these energy levels, they'll emit light at a specific wavelength. So this particular transition um, is uh, called H alpha, this three to two. Uh, and we've used this to study gas falling onto stars before. And it means that for young planets, for forming planets, we might see a spike of emission corresponding to that line, which is uh, in the visible, it's actually a deep red color. So, a couple of places to look, um, which I'll be talking about later, are at that H alpha line and also in the infrared. Okay. And like James mentioned uh, during his introduction, we use really big telescopes to do science like this. Um, so there are a couple of uh, telescopes that I'll be showing results from later on. And so one of them is one that I used as a grad student, the Large Binocular Telescope, um, which is kind of what it sounds like. It's two eight meter mirrors um, on, a, on a common mount. So they, they point together. And uh, just for a sense of scale here, you can see a, a pickup truck parked down below the dome. So these are really enormous uh, observing facilities. Uh, and at UC, we have access to the Keck telescopes, um, which are 10 meter diameter telescopes. So this is an image of, of the two Keck telescopes on Mauna Kea. And again, for scale, uh, an SUV down here. So we use these really big telescopes to observe these young stars to try to actually image in the gaps of the protoplanetary disk. We do that because a bigger telescope gets you a higher resolution view. So here at UCI, we love astronomy. Peter the anteater also loves astronomy. We can imagine that Peter wants to try to look for planets around young stars uh, using his 10 or 20 centimeter telescope. So you might see a picture like this. Um, it's pretty blurry. You could imagine there might be a planet buried here in the glare of the star, but we can't see it because this telescope is too small. So in theory, if I were going to use my Keck telescope and look at the same star where there might be a planet, I would see something like this uh, with a much more compact uh, image of my star. I can actually separate the starlight from the planet light and then characterize just the photons that are coming from my planet. So this is an ideal world. Uh, this is what a big telescope gets you in theory. Um, this is not what happens in practice. And that's because we have to look through the Earth's atmosphere. So stars twinkle. Twinkling stars are bad for doing high contrast imaging. Uh, 
all of the turbulent motions in the Earth's atmosphere blur out the image of your star. And if I could take a super quick video of what my star would look like, where I could take a, a picture every um, every thousandth of a second or something, I would see this. So this is uh, motion because of the motion of the Earth's atmosphere. And for my longer pictures, my image of my star gets blurred out to actually about the same size as the image I would see with Peter the Anteater's 20 centimeter telescope. So a way to control that is using adaptive optics. So in an AO system, uh, so I might call adaptive optics AO for the rest of the talk, uh, we, we use a deformable mirror where we can change the shape of our mirror very quickly to correct the turbulent uh, the, the degradation of our images because of the turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere. So this uh, schematic shows you uh, kind of a, a block diagram of how that works, is that you bring in your distorted light uh, that's passed through the atmosphere. You uh, change the shape of your mirror to try to make these sort of squiggly lines flatter <laughs> to, you know, unblur your, your light. Uh, you send some of your light to something called a wavefront sensor that measures just how blurry your light is, uh, which then talks to a computer that tells your deformable mirror to change its shape again. And your corrected light gets sent down here um, to your science camera. And you, you change the shape of your mirror um, at least as quickly as you, as you expect the atmosphere to be changing. Um, and ideally much faster. So these deformable mirrors tend to get changed a um, hundred to a couple thousand times a second. And they can have different sizes. You can have really big ones. Um, here's an example of a deformable secondary mirror. So this is where you um, actually make the second mirror in your telescope, the deformable one. Uh, and you can also have much smaller ones that live further down in your instrument, um, like this one, which is about the size of a penny. So AO is, is really amazing. It's done wonders for directly imaging planets. Uh, and, and this movie kind of shows you uh, an animation of what I was describing on the last slide. So this is your blurry light coming in. This is a visualization of you measuring just how blurry it is. Uh, this is what you tell your mirror to do, and then this is the result. Um, much flatter, more uh, consistent light than you had before. And you can see here, this is what a quick video of your image looks like without adaptive optics, and then this is what it looks like with adaptive optics. So it's much easier to look uh, somewhere like right here for a faint planet than it is to try to pull that signal out of this image. And so before I talk about uh, using this technology to study planets, I just wanted to show a couple of really cool uh, examples of adaptive optics work done at Keck Observatory. So um, you might have heard recently about the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics going to Galactic Center work. So Andrea Gez from UCLA shared the Nobel Prize um, for her work on uh, studying the galactic center using adaptive optics. So that's what this uh, animation on the left shows, is that it's much easier to track the orbits of these stars when you can actually see the individual stars um, better, thanks to AO. Uh, and we also do a lot of AO-assisted solar system work at Keck. So this shows our ability to take pictures of storms on Neptune um, using adaptive optics. So two, two really really cool examples of this technology at use. Steph, we have a quick, uh, we have one question that relates to the first kind of move, the most two slides ago movie of the uh, uh, adaptive optics illustration. And Dennis uh, is, uh, Silverman is asking, are those rings that you see in that picture, are those, are those real? Are those the real rings? Oh, yes, good question. Um, these are not the, these are not rings. Um, because of anything astrophysical, this is actually what the image of a point source through your circular telescope looks like. Um, and I 
won't give a super long-winded explanation of that right now, but the idea is that um, because of the wave nature of light, uh, when you use a circular telescope to look at something like a distant star, which is just a point source, the image of your point source has these rings around it because of the diffraction of light by your optical system. Um, so this is actually pretty close to what a perfect image through uh, like a theoretical telescope should look like. It's a good, good clarifying question, thank you. Okay, uh, so adaptive optics has led to uh, our really a range of uh, amazing images of light from exoplanets themselves. Um, this is one particularly famous system. I should say in both of these images, uh, light from the central star has been removed. So this is where the star would be in these images and they've been post-processed to get rid of that and just show the light from the planets. Uh, so this is called the HR 8799 system. Uh, it has four giant planets. They're at pretty wide separations, um, starting at something like 20 AU to you know, much wider. So the scale bar is 20 astronomical units. Uh, and we've been monitoring uh, uh, their orbits, the community has, um, using Keck from uh, something like 2008 until present. So this, this video shows uh, actual orbital motion of these planets observed using the Keck telescopes uh, over about eight years. And when we can actually collect photons from these planets, we can characterize things like their atmosphere. So these are, these are fully formed planets that we've imaged using adaptive optics at Keck. Uh, and Imaging fully formed planets is pretty difficult from a contrast point of view. So a typical giant exoplanet that is done forming, but that is still pretty young um, is something like a million times fainter than uh, the star that is orbiting. So that's like trying to take a picture of a firefly next to a lighthouse, very difficult. Uh, you can ask the same question, how faint is a forming planet compared to its host star? Uh, and we're a little lucky there because uh, forming planets are much brighter in the infrared than uh, mature planets are. They're actually something like 100 to 10,000 times fainter than the stars that they orbit. So that's great. Um, that's because they're hot and because the infalling material uh, releases gravitational potential energy um, in the form of radiation. So that's, that's something that's easier about trying to image forming planets. Um, but young stars are really far away. So the, the distances to the stars where we try to image uh, mature planets are something like 50 light years, give or take. Uh, young stars, the most nearby ones, are at a distance of 500 light years. That means that if Peter really wants to image forming planets, it's going to be much more difficult to do that just because the most nearby young stars are distant. So it's a lot harder to separate the light from the star and the planet on the sky. So what does that mean? Um, that's like if I were down here um, at the Brennan Event Center and Peter's there and I took his basketball and I went up here to the Trinity Alps Wilderness about 600 miles away and I told him that he needed to take a picture of the basketball. So we need really, really high resolution um, to actually image these things. Uh, and we've started to get there with, with more traditional methods. Um, so one really cool system that has been recently discovered um, is PDS-70. So this is a system with uh, a big gapped protoplanetary disk uh, with two very massive planets um, on pretty wide uh, orbits, something greater, something between 20 and 30 AU. Um, that are actively forming. So this is super exciting. We're now directly imaging protoplanets. Um, with traditional methods, we're, we're getting down to pretty wide angular, separa angular separations, which um, correspond to uh, spatial separations of something like 20 astronomical units. Um, high masses, a few to something like 10 Jupiter masses. So some goals going forward 
uh, for building a census of these things are getting down to tighter orbits, um, things more like where the giant planets are in our own solar system, like 5 to 10 AU. Uh, lower masses down to closer to our own Jupiter mass. Uh, and also to detect and characterize at longer wavelengths. Something like a few to five microns, like I mentioned before. So most of the, uh, pretty much all of the imaging um, with traditional methods for these things has been uh, at shorter wavelengths, something like out to two to three microns um, with a handful of, of images taken at three to four. Um, but all of the spectroscopy, we we're actually trying to understand what the composition of these things uh, is, is only out to about two microns. So something to keep in mind for later on in this talk. So the way that uh, I try to push uh, our spatial resolution is by increasing the effective angular resolution of our telescope um, using a technique that's called aperture masking. Uh, so with our normal setup using Keck, our primary mirror looks like this uh, and our image looks like this. So here you're seeing um, your core of your, of your image of your star and you can see one of the rings that I, I talked about before that's just because of your optical setup. Uh, with aperture masking, you change your, your setup so that rather than having one big primary mirror, uh, you put a mask in and turn it into an array of smaller ones. You don't actually do this over the primary. Um, what you do is you put a little uh, mask further down in your optical path uh, in, the, in a place where you might put a filter. So they, they have sizes of something like an inch to a couple of inches. And what it does is it blocks most of your light, somewhere between 80 and 90% of your light, and lets light through from a small set of, um, of smaller apertures. And so then your image looks like this. It's, it's really pretty. Um, again, this, is, this image is all, um, the structure in this image is all instrumental. So you're seeing this, this complex pattern because of the light from each of these little holes interfering with the light from the other ones. Uh, and the bottom line for using this technique is that you can get to much tighter scales because it's a lot easier to characterize the imperfections in your AO system and also in your instrument when you use a setup like this. So it's really easy to identify your noise and to eliminate it. And this gets us uh, a factor of a few in angular resolution, which is actually a big boost when you're looking at these really distant systems. So some highlights uh, from this work uh, one is that we've been able to identify planet candidates in protoplanetary disks. So this is um, this is a set of images uh, that were taken from uh, the Large Binocular Telescope and also from uh, the Magellan Telescope um, in 2014 and 2015. And on the left, you can see in grayscale a gapped protoplanetary disk. Uh, and inside the disk, we see emission in the infrared and at hydrogen alpha. Um, and so if you zoom in, this is what's on the right side here. Uh, there are three sources that we see in the infrared, um, only three at one particular wavelength. So this is 3.8 microns. Um, we see two at two microns and then one also at H alpha. So seeing H alpha from one of these uh, is really exciting because it corresponds to those transitions that you would expect to see if you had gas being shock heated because it's falling onto a planet. Uh, so we've been monitoring this system for a while. Um, there is some work still to be done on understanding the sources that we only see in uh, one or two wavelengths, um, but we actually can see signs of orbital motion of these, which is really exciting. Um, and using techniques like masking is a way that we can get to closer separations than we can with traditional methods. So you notice here that the, the scale bar is 10 AU. Um, so it's a, a nice boost in terms of exploring the inner regions of these young systems. Hey Steph, um, not to derail you too much, but okay. I, we've got a couple <laughs> of questions about aperture masking and, and okay. I thought it might be time to ask them now before you go on. 
Let me just mention, because Steph is not going to brag about herself too much, but this technique of aperture masking is super clever, uh, quite subtle. Uh, and she is one of the real pioneers of this effort and one of the people who's got it to work. Uh, it, this is non-trivial stuff and Steph is really one of the best in the world at this. And we have some questions about it. So I thought I'll just throw okay. them back at you. I yeah. obviously, you are the expert here. Um, <laughs> So the first question from Jonathan is, uh, would different shapes of those holes affect the image? Um, like they're hexagonal, what if they were circles? How would that how would that change things? So that's kind of the first question. The other one is, how do you choose those patterns? Like which ones to open and which ones to block and how does that affect things? Yeah, yeah, those are great questions. Uh, I'm just gonna go back to my image. Yeah, so there are, um, so the first one for hole shape, uh, there are a handful, so the the, mask that I'm showing here has hexagonal holes. This is actually not the, the Keck mask. Um, the Keck mask actually looks something like this, but I don't have a picture of the physical mask itself. Um, so there are masks that have circular or hexagonal um, holes in them. Uh, you, can, you can use either. Um, one reason you might want to use a hexagonal hole is to, if you had segments in your mirrors that are hexagons, um, then you can collect a little bit more, a little bit more light. Um, if you're just trying to like fit one of your apertures onto a mirror segment, um, they will change the the way that your image looks. Um, and I wouldn't say that. Uh, whoops, sorry about that. I wouldn't say that one is any um, better than the other. Uh, but you do need to take that into account when you're deciding how to to actually work with the data. Um, cause it's going to change like where you're going to want to sample to actually calculate your observables. Uh, and then as far as how you choose the patterns of holes in your masks, uh, you're, you're, you're kind of trying to optimize a few different things. So you, you want enough throughput so that you don't have to, uh, make your exposures prohibitively long to actually collect light. And the thing that's counterintuitive about masking is that, um, when you add more holes, you have to make them smaller because one of the important things about your mask is that you don't want your um, any of your baselines in your mask to to have the same orientation or separation. So that means um, that you have to make sure that every pair of holes in your mask has a unique separation and position angle. Um, so you would think you might want to just like fill this with a whole bunch of, of little circles, but that can create noise if you if you end up with with too much um, too much overlap between the pairs of holes in your mask. Uh, and so avoiding that, then you're just trying to think about um, how many holes you need to get enough information about the thing you're looking at. So the more holes you have, the better a job you can do at understanding the thing you're observing. Uh, if you're looking at something that's really complicated and extended, you might want more holes. Um, if you were, if you knew you were just looking at something like a binary, you could get away with something like three. Um, so yeah, in general, number of holes, something between like three and 18. Um, yeah, and people have spent a lot of time optimizing these things using simulations. Thanks, Steph. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Uh, so another highlight uh, that kind of falls out of looking for these forming planets is characterizing the innermost regions of these protoplanetary disks. Um, one cool result that has uh, come out of my group in the last uh, couple of years or year-ish um, is detecting spiral structure within a, a disk millimeter clearing. Uh, so here we're seeing uh, scattered light from small grains that are inside the cleared region of your protoplanetary disk that you see in the millimeter. So the idea is that you have little grains inside your big millimeter hole um, and you see a, some spiral structure here that's actually very different from the structure of the millimeter disk. Um, so this is signs of a possible disk planet interaction. That's some nice, nice science that falls out of, of looking inside these disk clearings. And so some ongoing work right now is doing a survey of these gapped protoplanetary disks using Keck. Um, Christina Vides, who is a first year student, is leading this work. Uh, and you can see a handful of images uh, from our observations so far. 
Um, we have uh, dis this dis detection that I was just showing. We've got a couple that are like that. Um, we have some candidates that we're following up. Uh, this is a binary star um, that at least shows that, <laughs> that this technique uh, is, is doing what it should be. It's a good test always. Um, and so some big questions for this survey are um, how common are these giant forming planets in gapped protoplanetary disks? How quickly do forming planets sweep up material? And what are the orbital architectures of the youngest planetary systems? How do they compare to mature ones? Uh, so in general, we can get down to uh, forming Jupiter mass planets that have separations of something like uh, five to 10 astronomical units. Uh, and our sample, when we're finished, is going to be large enough that we can answer this first question um, with a maximum uncertainty of something like 20%. So we'll actually be able to uh, constrain the presence of giant forming planets to within somewhere between 20, 10 and 20%, depending on um, uh, how many we actually find. So this is um, some work that I'm very excited about, um, especially to see where it goes in the next couple of years. So in the last few minutes, I just wanted to say a couple words about um, upcoming instruments that are going to do this science better um, that I've been involved in. Uh, one is holographic aperture masking. So if you thought the regular picture of aperture masking I showed you before was weird, um, this is even weirder. Uh, this gives you um, a spectral resolution in addition to the super uh, resolution that I talked about before. Um, so with holographic masking, rather than using just a metal mask with some holes in it, you actually um, can use these liquid crystal coated optics to move light around in your um, in your focal plane, so just on your detector. Uh, so this is a picture of one of these optics. So this is someone's thumb and forefinger. Uh, these are the kinds of patterns that we put over each one of these hexagons. Uh, and those patterns determine where on your detector light is going to show up. So this is actually what the image of a point source looks like through a holographic mask. Um, this is what it looks like at a single wavelength. And then this is if I use a range of wavelengths where I have like some filter that has a bandwidth. And so you can see comparing these that the difference is that in the, the image that has bandwidth, you're smearing out your image um, on your detector. And that's because these little uh, patterns actually act like um, kind of like prisms, more, more like they're, they're basically little diffraction gratings if you're familiar with, with that kind of jargon. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. All it means is that the location where your light shows up depends on the wavelength. So that means that I can sample this image from here to here and actually measure um, a flux as a function of wavelength for the thing I'm interested in. And uh, the last instrument I'll talk about um, is called SCALES. This is, uh, stands for the Santa Cruz Array of Lenslets for Exoplanet Spectroscopy. This is a collaboration between a bunch of people. Um, I am the project scientist for this instrument. Um, it is an integral field spectrograph. So the, a, a theme that's common between all of these upcoming projects is that we're trying to get spectral information about these objects. Um, so what happens with scales is that you take every point in your image and you send the light from each point in your image through a prism, which gives you a spectrum for each one of uh, the little boxes here in this animation. So you have a spectrum for every point in your image. And then what you can do is you can build up a cube of images at each of the wavelengths. Um, so scales is going to operate between two and five microns. This, uh, this uh, illustration just shows you what you're kind of trying to picture when you're thinking about what the data will look like in the end. Um, and this wavelength range is really unique because it's, it's perfect for looking for forming planets and for characterizing um, cold ones. And this image here is actually one of Scales's uh, interesting science cases, which is uh, observing volcanoes on Io. So this instrument is going to do more than just exoplanets and planet formation. Um, it'll actually have a, a really interesting range of solar system applications. Uh, but as far as using it for planet formation science goes, it's going to be really powerful. Um, this animation shows you a planet um, in a gapped protoplanetary disk. 
uh, as a function of wavelengths. This is going from about 2.8 to 4.2 microns. And it's kind of hard to see in this animation, but what you're what you can notice is that the disk becomes dimmer at long wavelengths, but the planet brightens. So this is going to be a really exciting application because if you look at different wavelengths, which is what's shown on the right side here, you can see that the planet becomes brighter um, and the disk becomes fainter. So this will help us not only characterize planets, but also distinguish between light from the planet um, and uh, scattered light from dust in your protoplanetary disk. So looking ahead, there are uh, some really exciting upcoming observational facilities that will do amazing exoplanet and planet formation science. Um, one scheduled to launch uh, in 2021, the end of this year is James Webb. Uh, James Webb is going to have an aperture mask in it and it's going to be really complementary to um, instruments and uh, telescopes like Keck because it's much more sensitive. Um, so we'll be able to observe fainter planets using something like James Webb. Uh, the next generation of extremely large telescopes is going to do wonders for our resolution. We'll actually get down to uh, spatial separations like a couple of AU for these young systems. Um, the 30 meter telescope uh, is particularly exciting for UC uh, because we'll have access to it. Um, for as far as I'm concerned, scales is going to turn into uh, a second generation TMT instrument. So that's super exciting um, to me personally. I, I think it's, um, it's, so the name of that instrument is the Planetary Systems Imager. Um, and that's going to, to get us down to Jupiter mass planets at a, a few AU um, for forming planets um, and even less massive than that. Uh, and it'll also enable us to actually start to image things like rocky terrestrial planets um, in habitable zones. So PSI uh, is going to do amazing exoplanet science once um, TMT is online. Uh, and as far as other US observational facilities, GMT uh, is going to have similar angular resolution, uh, get us uh, down to similar uh, solar system scales. And, and using the two of them together will be even more powerful for um, studying systems uh, like the ones I've shown you today and others that are in different parts of the sky. Um, so the future is bright for, for studying exoplanets and planet formation. Um, so that is all that I have for you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Steph, thanks so much. What a wonderful talk. Um, we've had lots and lots of questions here <laughs> and I don't know, I don't think I can possibly get them all with our couple minutes left. Let, let me ask you one that, that came up that I thought was kind of fun to you know think about. Um, and it had to do with the makeup of these protoplanetary disks. And the question is, where do all of the complex molecules come from uh, that eventually make their way into planets and places like the Earth? Uh, you know, we know the heavy elements are made in stars and supernovae, but then when you start building big, complex, maybe organic molecules, where does that happen? Is, do we need a plant, protoplanetary disk for that to that kind of thing to happen? That's, I guess, a yeah. question. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so there, the, the places that we can form really complex molecules like that, um, they need to be pretty cold. Um, one, so one place where we see those molecules that is like very early in the life cycle of forming stars and planets is in the interstellar medium. Um, so I showed you early on in this talk pictures of the Orion molecular cloud. Um, we can actually find a lot of molecules um, that are very complex in uh, molecular clouds like that. And so then that material ends up in your um, clump that you're collapsing and in your protoplanetary disk and can end up as part of your planetary atmosphere. Um, and, and we do see molecules, um, you know, things like water, uh, carbon monoxide in pretty high concentrations in protoplanetary disks. Thanks. We'll try to do one kind of final question here as people are hopefully stick around for one extra minute. Um, so it's about the future telescopes. And so one question is, you mentioned this with JWST, how are these aperture masking technologies influencing future telescopes and future designs. And then maybe quickly, people are asking, where are these big telescopes going to be? Um, we don't know exactly where TMT is going to go yet, but uh, you can speak to those things. 
quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the first one, um, aperture masking and future instruments. Um, one thing that's nice about masks, uh, like the ones I've shown you, is that they're, they're really cheap compared to like building an entire instrument. Um, as you know, with James Webb, we're not going to be able to go out there and change anything after it exists. Um, but for the ground based instruments, as long as there's a place um, to put a mask, which is actually usually in the same place as you would put a filter, you can just put one in. And if you can do something like change a filter, you can change a mask. Um, something else I should mention is that for these, um, for actually for all of these, we're going to have, um, we don't have the problem of the atmosphere for James Webb. Um, and for the ground based facilities, we're going to have really powerful AO systems, um, which means that there's room for uh, using data reduction techniques that are similar to the way we work with masking, um, but with just a completely unmasked uh, telescope. And that is um, beyond <laughs> what I was going to talk about uh, today. But basically, if you have really amazing adaptive optics systems, you can get the same resolution um, by doing really sophisticated data processing as if you were using a mask. So I think those are um, like, it's easy to put a mask in and there are interesting interferometry directions that we're heading in because of the quality of the upcoming instruments. Um, and then, okay, location. So uh, the giant Magellan telescope is going to be in Chile. Um, and TMT, like James said, is still up in the air. Um, options are Hawaii, the Canary Islands. Um, those are the two that you're probably hearing the most about. Um, and so, yeah, I think with um, combining them, you, you gain in sky coverage. So you can observe a larger portion of nearby stars look for exoplanets and um, young stars in different regions of the sky. Great, thank you so yeah. much, Steph. And let me just mention, uh, this talk will be uploaded to the School of Physical Sciences website. So you can look there and we will be advertising it there with, with news, et cetera, and look for links. The school also has a YouTube channel. And if you just kind of go on YouTube and search for UCI School of Physical Sciences, it will also be up there uh, if you want to find it. Uh, again, here's the text to give number, PSBLS to 41444. Thank you so much, Steph, again. Thanks, everybody, for logging in today. And until next time, bye-bye. Thank you.